Chapter 9, May 30th. Today's the day I'm hoping to, uh, I'm going shopping with Jennifer Reed. All morning, I've been trying to think of a style that would define her, you know, a visible expression of who she is. I've imagined everything from retro 60s to 90s glitz. But what continually comes to mind is a long flannel skirt and white blouse with a cameo at the neck and a calculator in the pocket. She's telling me, she picks me up, telling me how she's been looking forward to this all week and how we're going to have this fab day. Ouch. I won't survive if I have to listen to this all no. Um, listen to this all day. Oh, no kidding, I say. Fab. More than fab. Maybe even awesome. I must discreetly try to update her lingo. We head to the Park Royal Shopping Center. I think I've forgotten to mention something about me. I hate shopping. I know, like, my gender is supposed to be wild for it. Don't get me wrong. I like to look nice. But I can't go for hour upon hour from store to store and stay interested. I get bored after 30 minutes. Joanne, on the other hand, can make a career out of it. If she were paid to prance around stores, modeling in mirrors the way she does, she'd be quickly a very wealthy woman. And if I were paid for the number of hours I've been forced to stand there watching her, I would also make a few bucks. So I have to admit, I was already pretty certain this day was going to be tedious. We walk in the store, and there in front of us is a mannequin, dressed in narrow black slacks, pack, pants, silk shirt, and soft suede jacket. Too Cosmo for me. But for Jennifer? If she could handle leaving the collar open, it might just work. And I tell her so. Think so? Yeah, I think so. She tries it on. All right. I'm really quite impressed. Jennifer buys the entire outfit just like that. Well, that was easy. Let's see. What else? Next, I find a totally wicked hand-embroidered Waist-length denim jacket. Jennifer tries it on. Go for a relax. Take that clip out of your hair and mess it around a bit. Jennifer attempts to, but relaxed causes her some stress. She moves two or three places out of place. Not like that, like this. Using my fingers as combs, I lift her blonde hair high and let it fall to float around her face. And don't do this button up. There. What do you think? She smiles in the mirror and nods. I can tell she's pleased. 45 minutes later, we are out of there. Jennifer carries three new outfits, and I have four no bras. Don't ask. Let's just put it down to necessity. We've done all right. To thank me, she takes me to Earl's for lunch. Good, she says, after we've ordered. We've still got the entire afternoon ahead. Now we can have some fun. Oh, I remember who I am with. Miss Mathematics. Miss loves to play with numbers. Does this mean a thrilling quiz in calculus? Oops, I think I've said it out loud. Jennifer giggles. Only a dweeb would do that. No, I was thinking more like a walk around the seawall or ice cream at Granville Island or whatever you like. And I was thinking about the word dweeb. Dweeb, I asked Jennifer, what exactly does that mean? She gets this pink kind of flush. I don't know, kind of like a nerd, I guess. Someone who's very boring. Usually because they're so obsessed with something they can't get away from it. That's not to say that something is good or bad, but they're always trying thinking about it and can never relax. And when they try to, really stupid things come out of their mouth. It's their attempt to make them seem like they are having fun. You know a lot about dweebs. Jennifer just nods. The waitress serves us lunch. Mind if we drop by my office on the way to wherever we're going just for five minutes? Okay, I say, biting into my burger. Where are we going? You choose. I think for a moment. I'll say it because I want a reaction. What about the art gallery? Jennifer almost chokes on a red pepper. Really? For sure. Oh, I love to walk through the Emily Carr exhibit. Her expression quickly changes from one of excitement to this quizzical look. You're not just saying that, Pam. Why? She stabs at her food. Well, because you think it's something a dweeb would like to do. I have to laugh. If it is, that makes me one too. Jennifer smiles and relaxes. How's the stir fry? I ask. Tops, she says. She sees my mouth drop open. I mean tasty, very tasty. In fact, you might even call it super. No, it's awesome. It's super awesome. I'm laughing. As long as you're enjoying it. It's a long, smooth glide up the elevator to the top of the bank in Jennifer's office. Once we've stopped, we pad out the door and down the hallway on this plush pink carpet. I look behind it. My footprints are bigger than hers are. Jennifer's humongous polished desk faces a wall of long, shiny windows and a major view of Burrard Inlet. I can see nearly the entire North Shore from up here, from the Lions to Seymour Mountain. I can see where Lonsdale cuts high into Grouse Mountain, the cars moving up it looking like tiny toys from way up here. Jennifer tells me to make myself comfortable at her desk. She'll only be a moment. So I do. I lean back in her big leather chair and look around me. There's only one other person here, Marie. Jennifer introduced her as her secretary on the way in. 
We had to walk through her glass office to get in here. I watched Marie walk toward Jennifer. She's carrying a file folder and looking real concerned. She refers to it while asking Jennifer a question. Jennifer glances at the file, but only for a moment. Right away, she tells Marie exactly what to do in this confident sounding voice. Like she knows exactly what she's talking about. But then I guess maybe she does. Like after all, she's in charge up here. She must know her stuff. Jennifer and Marie finish their conversation with, is Marie laughing? A joke? Jennifer made a joke? Well, when you're sure of yourself, I guess anything can happen. Her chair is so cool. It rocks, it spins, it tilts. She's a super modern computer and a telephone that is ringing. I look at Jennifer. I look at her secretary. I push the button that is flashing. Hello, I say. Miss Reed? No. There's a short hesitation. Can I speak to Miss Reed? The voice of an older man sounds urgent. I'm looking at the view at the expanse of just before me. I feel power. This is major control. May I ask who's calling? I hear my voice, hot, sizzling with confidence. It must be catchy. Bren Bremnar. Ben Bremnar, please tell her it's important. I'll tell her, but I know she's very busy. I hold the phone away from my ear. Miss Reed, I sing. A Mr. Ben Bremnar is on the phone for you. Jennifer leaves the secretary's office and comes over to her desk. I hand her the phone. I lean back in the chair and cross my feet on the desks. She talks to Mr. Bremnar in this real calm voice, telling him exactly what to do, taking charge of the urgent situation. And by her manner, I can tell it's a common thing for her to do. I could see her doing it in one of her technical suits. In this room, reflected in those windows, next to this desk, it would fit. So you're chipper with that, Ben? Where does she get these words? Good. Talk to you soon. She sounds so cheery. I'm sure Mr. Bremnar is better than Chipper. I think she likes this job. I think she must be half decent at it, too. People seem to value what she thinks and says. That must make her feel good. Okay, let's get out of here, Pam. Marie, we're off to the art gallery. Marie's standing in the door of her office, smiling. You two have a good time. I just had a thought. Maybe I have Jen all wrong. Maybe she isn't so weird. Maybe she's had plenty of takers. Maybe she's just been having too much fun doing what she likes to do. Three hours later, we're on our way home, driving down Ross Road in Lynn Valley when I spot Matt Layton. He has stopped to throw a stick for Lupus, Mr. Spinelli's German Shepherd. Lupus tries to trap anyone who walks by his yard into playing with him. He's been doing it for as long as I can remember. Matt leans back, aiming so Lupus gets a good run just short of the house. He hurls the stick. Lupus tears after it. Now that's a healthy looking specimen, Jen comments. Yeah, he begs to play every time you walk by the house. Jen looks at me with her eyes smiling. I didn't mean the dog. I feel my face, face flush. She must have seen me looking. Chapter 10. I've decided that I'm going to be a shiftless drifter when I grow up with no fixed address. It's the easiest way out. I'm fed up with people asking me what I want to be. I can't even think about it. These last few years have been so skewy. I can't even, I can hardly think ahead to the next day. Even plans for the next hour can be iffy. Six years from now, may as well be 60. Mrs. Dolly Rimple came into the homeroom yesterday to discuss career choice or to discuss course choices for next year. We should have a good idea where we're going, she said, so we don't limit our options for the future. We have to think hard about our interests and abilities and discuss it with our parents. And remember, the world is our oyster. What a gross saying. It doesn't make the least bit of sense. Some people know exactly what they want to do. Darla Miller wants to be a veterinarian. She's been big into horses since she was six years old. Mike Ortega is going to take over his dad's garage someday. He's never considered anything else. Danielle Higgins wants to be, big surprise, a supermodel. Never mind that she's only five foot two. Joanne is considering becoming an elementary school teacher, an engineer, or a talk show host. Is that something you just decide to be? I asked after Mrs. Dalrymple left the classroom. I was referring to her third choice. Yeah, I guess so. If the world's my oyster, I can decide whatever I want. What about you, Pam? I already told you, a shiftless drifter. Can't, said Mandeep. You're already overqualified. You should have dropped out in like grade eight. I'm going to take fine arts and play flute for the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra. What about you, Lynn? My mom wants me to be a dentist. Ugh, oh, we all groaned. How could you stand to like put your hands in just anyone's mouth, I asked. Can you imagine like Carl Jenkins or, or Mr. Bartell? Ooh, we all said again, including Linda. It'll be so good. I can be super selective. I'll be so good. I can be super selective. Joanne looked at me. Seriously, Pam, there are so many things you're good at. Look how well you did on your English essay. What about a writer of some type? It was true. 
Mr. Bartell gave me a 96% in the in class essay we wrote on Thursday. He said I showed incredible insight in the group dynamics of the tribes. I think he was sucking up to me for causing me to lose it in class. I don't have any ideas, I answered, and nobody wants to listen if you don't have anything to say. Well, what about a forest ranger? Then you could spend all your time sitting up in a tree. I made a face. Why don't you forget the flute and become a comedian, Mandeep? Joanne went and dropped it. You like art? You like paintings? Who's that artist you really get off on? You know, that weird one that had rodents for pets? Who's a member of the group of seven? I was forced to roll my eyes. Emily Carr? She was not a member of the group of seven, and she wasn't weird. You should be so weird that you can paint like that. Come on, Pam, don't get so hostile. We're only trying to help. And I guess they were. But there's this thing I can't tell them because they would never understand. A year and a half ago, I was like this little girl still growing up. That ended like boom. Now I'm this semi-adult who has to make these major decisions about what I'm going to do with my life. The thing is, I don't want this happening. Not yet, not now. Not without my mom knowing. But I can't make it stop. My whole world is changing, getting way out of my control when I want it to stand still. But it's not just me. Everyone around me is changing. There's this whole major attitude change that sucks. Like our teachers. Two years ago, they didn't act like it was a pain if we asked them questions. A few years ago, they had patience with us. Now it seems we're too difficult to teach. Like if we open our mouths, they can't wait to get them shut. In stores, the sale clerks used to be helpful. Now they follow us around like hawks. On the other hand, reluctantly remembering the peach sweater incident, I guess they have every right. Then there are other things, like trying to get used to this gazelle legs of mine, or like my period, which started, and other parts of me bugging out. Some days I'm so sore and tender and bloated and achy, but there's no one I can tell, not even dad, because I hate to say it, but he's part of all this. It's like, I'll break or something if he plays with me, throws me around the way he used to, or like he'll get a disease if he, gets me, if he gives me a giant hug. Sometimes I think it might just be something I've done. Boys in general have gone weird. Two years ago, they acted real stupid, but at least they ignored us. Now they act even more stupid, but they do it staring at our chests. I hate it. Can you imagine if we stared at them in a certain place like that? They'd be so self-conscious, they'd probably duck into the room thinking something was majorly wrong. I wish there was someone I could talk to, other than Joanna, my friends. We have discussions about these things, but they don't amount to much. Like last summer when we were tanning on my back lawn, Joanne insisted you're a woman the minute you get your first period. You're a woman because you can have a baby if you want. That's stupid, Linda told her. How can my little sister be a woman? She got her period when she was eight. Then Mandeep said, I think Joanne's right. You're a woman when you can procreate. When it comes down to it, isn't that the reason we were put on this earth? Procreate, said Linda. Yeah, you know, like reproduce. Linda frowned, like she always does when our talk turns to semi-serious stuff. Okay, maybe, but what if you don't get your period? Say, like, for some medical reason, and you can never procreate. Does that mean you're a child your entire life? Yeah, Joanne, Mandeep now agreed with Linda. Or what about if you don't get your period, but you have a test tube baby or whatever? What does it make you then? Joanne shrugged. Well, I guess if you're 20 or something, a woman, I guess. So it comes down to age, said Mandeep. Legally, you're an adult when you turn 18. I'm not sure how I knew that. Pam's right. So that's it. You're a woman when you turn 18. Linda settled back in the lawn chair and closed her eyes. Mandeep looked at her watch. Time to turn, she said, sipping her lemonade in the shade of the umbrella. She's our timekeeper when we tan, but she never tans herself. She says she's brown enough already. The rest of us flipped onto our stomachs. We were quiet for a while, letting the hot sun soak into our backs. I still think it's when you start your period, so Joanne. Aside from my height and the period thing, there are a zillion other changes since mom. My entire wardrobe is different. My hair has grown six inches and has been cut twice. I've changed my room around. I've made pumpkin pecan cake for dad's birthday. He didn't want me to, but I had to. It's the one mom always baked. I have a jar of sand from Eucala and a peach pit from the Okanagan. And then there's this other thing that happened that nobody knows about, not even dad. I like ice skating. Joanna and I have been going ice skating together since we were nine years old. Every Friday night during the winter, we take the bus from the center down Mountain Highway to the arena at the Winter Club. At 9 o'clock, we take it back. We get off at the center again and walk all the way down Ross Road. Joanne goes into her house, and I walk farther, turning on Hoskins towards mine. Last January was when it happened. Joanne had gone into her house. I was continuing down the street towards mine. This guy, like about 18 or whatever, was passing me. He was walking the opposite way on the other side of the street. 
I didn't look at him. I kept my eyes on the sidewalk. This is because I don't like to look in the eyes of people who I don't know. It was dark, but it wasn't raining. Actually, it was quite warm. We passed. But then the sound of his footsteps didn't continue like they should have. I heard them stop, then swing around. They become louder again, coming after me. He was right next to my side. I walked quicker. He walked quicker alongside me. He hung his arm over my shoulder. Hey, sweetie, where are you going in such a hurry? His breath was bad. His long whiskers scratched against my cheek. I had never had a man, not even my dad, so close to me. I tried to run, but he threw an arm across my collarbone and slammed my back against his chest. Where are you going, doll? He hissed. I couldn't move. I was pinned against him, and he was pressing his hand across my mouth. He hissed more things, worse things, in my ear. And as he said these things, he ripped a button from my jacket, and he squeezed. He kept on squeezing one of my breasts. I struggled so hard, but I couldn't move. And he kept on doing it, and it hurt so much. And I couldn't do anything except blubber like a little baby, because it hurt, but mostly because I hated him. I hated him so much, I would have killed him if I could have got my arms free. Instead, I bit him on the hand that he had wrapped around my neck. Right at that very same moment, the car came around the corner, sweeping light across us. It came to a sudden stop. Right at that very moment, a car came around the corner, sweeping light across us. It came to a sudden stop. He let go of me and I started running, faster than I've ever run in my life. I ran and ran and ran. I could feel my heart like it was ready to explode just below the skin of my chest. I didn't look back. I just kept on going. I tore up our driveway and flew in the side door down the hallway and into my bedroom. I curled in a ball and rocked back and forth on my bed. I couldn't stop crying, but I had to do it quietly. I didn't want dad to hear me. I could hear him on the telephone in his den. I pulled my pillow over my head and nearly choked myself so he wouldn't. But it was nearly an hour later before I could catch my breath and another one before I could even think again. A little while later, I came out of my room. Dad was surprised to find me sorting beads and scraps folding scraps of fabric in mom's hobby room. He said he was just about to call Joanne's. He was beginning to get worried. He hadn't known that I was home. I took a long shower that night and another one the next morning. I tried to get the smell of that man out of my head, but I never could. I mean, I can't. I can still smell him. And sometimes my breast still hurts. I wish sometimes there was someone I could talk to about it. Maybe that would help, but there isn't. My dad would absolutely freak. Besides, it's too embarrassing. Who would believe a thing like that would happen for no reason? They'd probably think I made it up. So that's it. I keep it to myself. Anyway, I don't feel like it happened to the real me, to the real Pamela Collins. Nothing's happened to her for quite some time. Sure, all these changes have taken place. Some kind of stuff has to fill the outer Pamela's days, but the real me is inside me in her hollowness. I'm stuck. I'm sitting alone in the dark, waiting for my mom to come home. I'm afraid to make a move without her. I'm afraid to turn on a light.